Hi everyone, my name is Hussein Heshmat. I am an associate professor of cardiology at Cairo University. It's my pleasure so that you join me in the coming minutes in our discussion on the interesting topic. There are several reasons why heart failure is an important topic. First, heart failure is a very prevalent condition. It's estimated in the United States that 5 million Americans have congestive heart failure and there are 500,000 new cases with heart failure diagnosed each year. But why is heart failure so prevalent? There are two reasons behind that. First, the population is aging all around the world and heart failure is mainly a disease of the elderly. The second reason is that heart failure is the end result of the wide spectrum of cardiac disorders. Take for example coronary artery disease. Now patients with myocardial infarction are treated with thrombolysis and primary PCI and their mortality rates have declined. So instead of dying, patients with coronary artery disease now survive and they survive for a long time and by the end of that long time they start to experience the consequences of the initial injury which eventually leads to congestive heart failure. The second reason why heart failure is an important condition is that it's a very dangerous disease. The prognosis of heart failure resembles that of the most serious malignant conditions. For example, a patient with congestive heart failure who's decompensated and as we will discuss in functional class 4, has a prognosis that is worse than, for example, breast cancer or leukemia. Those patients with functional class 4 heart failure have a one-year survival of less than 50%. Nevertheless, we still have therapies that can improve the symptoms, the morbidity, and the survival. So what is heart failure? Heart failure is a state or a syndrome that's actually difficult to define. We can think of a simple definition where heart failure is a condition where the heart is unable to provide a sufficient cardiac output to satisfy the metabolic needs of the body. This simple definition is rather incomplete because now we know that there are some conditions of heart failure where the cardiac output is normal and the metabolic demands of the body are not increased but the heart is able to provide the sufficient cardiac output only by an increase in the filling pressure and we think this is a more complete definition of heart failure so heart failure is the condition where the heart is unable to provide the metabolic demands of the body or can do that only with an increased Now, what are the causes of heart failure? As we mentioned earlier, heart failure is the end result of any disease or condition that involves the heart. 
So there are dozens and dozens of conditions that can cause heart failure. We can broadly classify them into three categories. First is a disease in the myocardium, like ischemic heart disease, myocardial infarction, abnormal coronary microcirculation, damage to the myocardium by heavy metals, toxins, radiation, by chemotherapeutic agents like uh, uh, chemotherapeutic agents used for treating malignancy, metabolic derangements like, like thyroid disorders, and genetic abnormalities that cause hypertrophic, dilated, or restrictive cardiomyopathy. The second broad condition where the myocardium is normal, but the loading conditions are disturbed. An increase in the afterload like hypertension, like valvular lesions, mitral, aortic incompetence, or stenosis, diseases of the pericardium, constrictive pericarditis, pericardial effusion, high output conditions like anemia, pregnancy, arteriovenous fistula, renal failure, and volume overload. And the third condition is arrhythmia, whether tachyarrhythmia or bradyarrhythmia. But if we would like to focus on the most important causes of heart failure in terms of prevalence, then we can think of four disorders. And this is important for prevention at the population level. The two most important causes of congestive heart failure are hypertension and coronary artery disease. The next two most common causes are valvular lesions and inherited As we said earlier, heart failure is a state or a syndrome. It's not a single disease entity. So we can think of at least six kinds of heart failure. We can classify heart failure by the duration of illness into acute or chronic heart failure. Acute heart failure usually develops within weeks, whereas chronic heart failure usually develops over months. However, the distinction in terms of time between acute and chronic is not sharp. The second classification is by which ventricle is affected more. When the left ventricle is affected more, as in coronary artery disease, in mitral or aortic valve disease, then it's left-sided. Whereas in when the right ventricle is affected more, as in pulmonary embolism, intracuspid valve diseases, or in endomyocardial fibrosis, then we call it predominantly right-sided heart failure. The third classification which is the most interesting is according to the ejection fraction. Decades ago we thought that heart failure is synonymous with an impaired ejection fraction but in the last years we noted that there is a syndrome of heart failure that we see in elderly females with a preserved ejection fraction. So you can find patients with heart failure who have a normal ejection fraction. We classify into heart failure with reduced ejection fraction when the ejection fraction is less than 40, preserved ejection fraction when it is more than or equal 50, and there is a third type which is in between, it's called heart failure in the mid-range ejection fraction.
What makes the heart fail? Whenever there is a stress or an injury or a hemodynamic overload, there are a series of changes that occur. First, at the level of the hemodynamics. Second, at the level of the nervous system and the hormones all over the body. And third, there are microscopic changes in the myocardium. And the mixture of these hemodynamics, neurohormonal and cellular changes can explain how the heart moves from the phase of stress, injury, overload into the phase of failure. The hemodynamic model of heart failure can be experienced by the frank starling curve. I guess we are all familiar with that. The frank starling curve states that an increase in the preload would cause more stretch of the sarcomeres and a stronger interaction between actin and myosin, and so contractility is boosted. This is seen in the early stages of ventricular enlargement secondary to volume overload. However, as the ventricle dilates further and becomes more stretched, Actin and myosin fibers tend to disengage with a decline in the contractile performance which contributes to heart failure. A similar change can be seen in hypertrophy secondary to pressure overload as in hypertension or aortic stenosis. Initially the heart compensates by increasing the wall thickness which is protective because it reduces the wall stress. But eventually hypertrophy is deleterious. Hypertrophy results in myocardial ischemia where simply the muscle outgrows its coronary supply. This results in diastolic dysfunction and replacement by fibrous tissue as the end diastolic pressure increases. In addition to the hemodynamic factors, a variety of nervous and hormonal systems are deranged in heart failure, secondary to myocardial injury and renal hyperperfusion. The activation of these neurohormonal systems has initial favorable effects, but as time progresses, these activations become deleterious. For example, for example initially, Sympathetic activation increases the heart rate, increases the contractility, increases the venous return, and helps to preserve the cardiac output. But with time, sympathetic activation also induces arteriolar constriction, which increases the afterload and increases the oxygen consumption. The same applies to the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which initially helps to maintain blood pressure through salt and water retention. But eventually, it also induces vasoconstriction, which increases the afterload. Similarly, vasopressin can induce the same changes initially and later on. An increase in interleukins and tumor necrosis factor alpha may initially help in myocyte hypertrophy, but later on it induces programmed cell death, which is known as apoptosis. Also, endothelin activation initially causes vasoconstriction, which maintains the systolic blood pressure and the cardiac output, but eventually excessive vasoconstriction increases the afterload and worsens the cardiac output.
Finally, the hemodynamic and neurohormonal changes reflect at the molecular or the cellular level on the heart, and this contributes further to the deterioration of myocardial performance. For example, changes in the calcium handling system results in cellular calcium overload, which results in arrhythmia. The beta-adrenergic receptors get desensitized, then down-regulated, and this blunts the positive enotropic effects of sympathetic activation. As a result of tumor necrosis factor alpha activation, apoptosis develops in the heart, and the number of functioning myocytes tends to decline, and this is replaced by an increasing amount of fibrous tissue, which is non-contractile. The American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology suggested a staging system for heart failure. And this might give you an idea on the resemblance between heart failure and malignant conditions. In stage A, it refers to those who are at risk of developing heart failure, but who have not developed yet a structural heart change. For example, patients with diabetes and patients with coronary disease who did not get a myocardial infarction. Stage B refers to individuals with structural heart disease, already damaged heart, like an reduced ejection fraction, chamber enlargement. However, they didn't develop the symptoms of heart failure yet. Stage C refers to patients who have the structural heart disease and already develop symptomatic clinical heart failure. Stage D refers to patients with end-stage or call it refractory heart failure that requires advanced intervention like biventricular pacing, defibrillation, assist devices, or transplantation. Note that this classification is different from the New York Heart Association functional class that we will describe later. Usually patients with heart failure progress in stages from A to D, and usually there is no going back. So a patient with stage C who develops clinical heart failure is very unlikely to go back to stage B and it's almost impossible to go back to stage A. Now we'll discuss the clinical picture of heart failure in terms of symptoms, signs, imaging, and laboratory findings. There is a wide range of symptoms and signs of heart failure. Some symptoms and signs are typical or specific, and others are less typical or specific. The, more typical, the most typical symptoms are dyspnea or thopnea, paroxysmal atonal dyspnea, fatigue, and ankle swelling. Whereas less typical symptoms can be seen in heart failure or other conditions include palpitation, dizziness, loss of appetite, etc. The signs that are very specific to heart failure include an elevated jugular venous pressure, a positive hepatojugular reflux, a gallop rhythm, and a displaced apical impulse. Less specific signs can be seen in other conditions, including crackles, tachypnea, kinestoke respiration, hepatomegaly, and a cardiac murmur. Try to focus and elicit more of the typical symptoms and signs of heart failure, as they have a stronger weight in the diagnosis of heart failure compared to the less typical symptoms.
there is always a need to objectively quantify the level of functional impairment in heart failure patients. The classification proposed by the New York Heart Association is the most widely used. Class 1 refers to no limitation, where the normal physical exercise doesn't cause any symptoms. Class 2, there is mild limitation, where the patients are comfortable at rest, but normal physical activity can produce symptoms. Class 3, where there is a marked limitation, where even less than normal physical activities can cause marked symptoms. And class 4, where the symptoms of heart failure are present even at rest. There is a strong relation between the degree of functional impairment and the prognosis. And as we mentioned earlier, patients who reach to the stage, uh, I'm sorry, to the uh, class 4 state of heart failure, they have a prognosis. The diagnosis of heart failure can be very difficult sometimes. As we mentioned earlier, there are some typical symptoms and signs, but not all patients will have these typical symptoms or signs. Pulmonary diseases can be difficult to differentiate from cardiac causes of dyspnea. In these situations where the cause of dyspnea is unclear, measuring the levels of brain natriuretic peptides can help. Elevated levels more than 125 picogram per milliliter for the N-terminal pro-BNP or more than or equal 35 picogram per ml for BNP, these levels strongly suggest heart failure as a cause. Other routine labs should be ordered in heart failure include thyroid profile. Thyroid disorders are not uncommon in patients with heart failure and control of thyrotoxicosis or hypothyroidism is essential in many patients to relieve the heart failure symptoms. Blood picture is important because anemia can contribute significantly to the pathology and symptoms of heart failure. Kidney functions, measurement of the glomerular filtration rate is a must because heart failure and chronic kidney disease frequently coexist. Diuretics, ACE inhibitors, and other heart failure medications can affect the kidney functions. Hyponatremia is common in heart failure and is associated with a poor prognosis. Serum potassium should be checked regularly in patients who are taking diuretics or mineralocorticoids. The electrocardiogram is abnormal in the vast majority of patients with chronic heart failure. The abnormalities may include ventricular enlargement, atrial enlargement, atrial or ventricular arrhythmia, ST segment changes suggestive of ischemia, or pathological Q waves suggesting an old myocardial infarction. It's very difficult to find a completely normal ECG in heart failure patients to the extent that a normal ECG may exclude chronic heart failure in patients with dyspnea. An important sign in the electrocardiogram is widening of the QRS complex, particularly a left bundle branch block morphology, because this sign may indicate that the patient may benefit from cardiac resynchronization therapy that we will describe later. 
There are several diagnostic imaging modalities that can be used in heart failure chest x ray, echo, cardiac catheterization, MRI, biopsy, etc. The treating physician should be able to choose among these images. The chest x-ray in patients with heart failure can show cardiac enlargement and can show different signs of pulmonary congestion like redistribution of the lung flow, the bat wing sign in pulmonary edema, and curly B lines. The x-ray is even more helpful in diagnosing a variety of lung pathologies and therefore can be helpful in differentiating cardiac Echocardiography is the most important tool in the assessment of heart failure. It's widely available, inexpensive, and can be performed in the bedside. Echo can quantify the ventricular volumes, the atrial volumes, can measure the left ventricular ejection fraction, and we use that to classify patients with heart failure into preserved ejection fraction, reduced ejection fraction, or mid-range ejection fraction. Echo can assess the diastolic functions of the left ventricle. These diastolic abnormalities might be the only abnormalities in some patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. ECHO can also diagnose and quantify the severity of valvular lesions. ECHO can suggest the presence of ischemia or scarring, but these findings of ischemia and scarring Echocardiography is also useful in assessing right ventricular dimensions and functions, in estimating pulmonary artery systolic pressure from the tricuspid incompetent signal, in assessing pericardial per effusion or pericardial constriction. Echo is also valuable for follow-up of the ejection fraction The use of cardiac MRI known as CMR is growing rapidly. CMR gives high quality images even when echo images are suboptimal. CMR can measure accurately LV and RV functions, can assess the severity of valvular lesions, and can quantify the amount of ischemic viable myocardium. CMR can also be used to diagnose some conditions of myocardial infiltration as sarcoidosis and amyloidosis. 
Cardiac catheterization is indicated in patients who have angina or typical chest pain to diagnose coronary artery disease through coronary angiography. During cardiac catheterization, ventricular angiography can be performed to measure the ejection fraction. Catheterization is the best method to measure the intracardiac pressures, the end diastolic pressure, pulmonary artery pressure, and the vascular resistance. These parameters do not only give prognostic information, but they can be used sometimes in critically ill patients with heart failure to guide their hemodynamic support. Nuclear testing can provide an accurate estimate of the ejection fraction of both the left ventricle and the right ventricle. It can also diagnose and quantify the extent of myocardial ischemia. An important concept that we should discuss here is myocardial viability. This refers to the presence of areas inside the myocardium that are underperfused but they are still viable. These areas are usually hibernating and they are not contracting properly. If these areas are really viable and they are revascularized, these may gain their systolic performance and improve the global myocardial systolic function. Despite all these advantages of nuclear testing, the current role of this modality seems to be regressing in the face of the growing interest, image quality and understanding. Endomyocardial biopsy performed percutaneous through the jugular or the femoral approach currently has a limited role. The most appropriate indications are the diagnosis of infiltrative disorders, fulminant myocarditis, and the diagnosis of graft rejection. Now we'll discuss the management of congestive heart failure. It can be broadly divided into three domains, lifestyle changes, drug therapy, and non-pharmacological invasion. There are certain lifestyle changes that are helpful in improving symptoms and avoiding hospitalization in heart failure patients. Excessive salt restriction is recommended, probably in the range of no more than 3 grams of sodium per day. Fluid restriction of 1.5 to 2 liters per day may be considered in patients with severe heart failure to relieve the symptoms of congestion. Abstain from Excessive alcohol intake is also important. We can encourage physical exercise to keep the strength of the skeletal muscles, and this is recommended. Immunization against influenza and pneumococci 
The list of available drugs for the treatment of heart failure is big and may grow further in the future. Over the coming slides, we will explain the role of each agent, the advantages and disadvantages pertinent to their use in heart failure. Diuretics are the main agents that improve the symptoms and signs of systemic and pulmonary congestion. It's very unlikely to find a patient with stage C heart failure who does not require a regular dose of diuretic. However, diuretics are not known to improve the survival. They only improve the symptoms. Therefore, it's recommended to use the least effective dose that keeps the patient euvolemic. Diuretics can cause hypotension, electrolyte abnormalities, and hyperuricemia. Diuretics should be titrated to achieve a proper negative fluid balance of about 500 ml per day. High ceiling diuretics are the low diuretics. Low ceiling diuretics are the thiazide diuretics which may not be very effective in patients with renal insufficiency. To achieve proper diuresis, some patients may require a combination of thiazide and low diuretics to achieve sequential nephron blockage which can overcome the diuretic. Mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, or MRE, help to relieve hepatic congestion through, blunt, through blunting aldosterone release. They have also shown to improve survival in patients with myocardial infarction and poor ejection fraction. The most common side effect of these medications is hyperkalemia. Also, the non-selective receptor antagonist spironolactone can cause painful gynecomastia. The more selective agent, which is a plerinone, does not cause gynecomastia, and has shown to improve survival in patients with heart failure. ACE inhibitors blunt the activation of the renin angiotensin system in heart failure. These are one of the most effective agents, and they have been shown to improve the ejection fraction and improve the survival in patients post-myocardial infarction and in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. ACE inhibitors should be used in all patients with heart failure unless they are contraindicated. The main side effects of these agents are secondary to the inhibition of the renin angiotensin system. The renin angiotensin system helps to maintain the renin blood flow. So, when ACE inhibitors blunt this activation, they can diminish the renal perfusion. They can cause hypotension, hyperkalemia, and worsening kidney functions. They can also cause a bothersome cough, and in rare cases... Angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARBs, can be used in heart failure in patients who cannot tolerate ACE inhibitors.
These agents' arms are also effective in inhibiting the activation of the renin angiotensin system. The main advantage is that they do not cause the cough, and this cough is a common cause for discontinuation of ACE inhibitors. However, the data of ARBs are limited compared to the data that we have on ACE inhibitors. The approved agents for heart failure are Valsartan and Candisartan. It's important to note that ARBs have the same limitation of ACE inhibitors in terms of worsening renal function, hyperkalemia. The newest agents for the treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction are the ARNIs, which stands for angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors. It's a combination of an angiotensin receptor blocker, Valsartan, and another agent called Sacubotril. Sacubotril in, is an inhibitor of neprilysin. Neprilysin is the enzyme that breaks down the natriuretic peptides. So Sacubotril tends to increase the circulating levels of brain natriuretic peptides and therefore it promotes vasodilatation and diuresis. The paradigm study showed that angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors are superior to ACE inhibitors in patients with heart failure. It should be kept in mind that these agents can cause significant hypotension and similar side effect to other angiotensin receptor blockers. Their high cost can be a concern and may limit their cost As we described earlier, excessive sympathetic activation is initially helpful in maintaining the cardiac output, but is eventually deleterious. Studies in the late 90s and early 2000s showed a beneficial effect of beta blockers in improving the ejection fraction and prolonging survival in heart failure patients with reduced ejection fraction. Beta blockers are among the most effective agents that can improve the outcome in patients with heart failure. It should be noted that Initially, beta blockers can be deleterious in decompensated class 4 patients. Beta blockers may worsen heart failure symptoms initially, cause fluid retention, hypotension, worsen bronchial asthma or heart block. Therefore, we should start by a small dose and increase the dose gradually, slowly over weeks, until we achieve the maximum tolerable dose. Avabradine has a unique pharmacological effect. It inhibits a current in the SA node that's called the funny current. Unlike beta blockers, avabradine can reduce the heart rate, the sinus rate, without having any negative enotropic effects. Reducing the heart rate can improve diastolic filling and optimize the hemodynamics in heart failure patients. The SHIFT study showed a beneficial effect of this drug on a combined endpoint of mortality hospitalization. The effect is mainly seen in patients with resting heart rate more than 70 or even 80 beats per minute. This drug is particularly appealing in patients who cannot tolerate maximum doses of beta blockers but still have high resting heart rates. A common side effect with this medicine is the flash of light
that can be seen secondary to the effect of the drug on the ion channel. Historically, digoxin was the classic treatment and the most effective treatment for heart failure. Again, it's the most convenient oral inotropic agent. However, over the past two decades, studies showed that digoxin has no favorable effect on mortality, even in patients with heart failure and rapid atrial fibrillation. Digoxin is a toxic drug. It has a neurotherapeutic window and toxicity can be fatal. This might be the reason behind its failure to improve survival. Currently, it has a limited role, only as an add-on therapy in patients who remain symptomatic despite maximum pharmacological treatment with diuretics, ACE inhibitors, and beta blockers. There may be some data on the beneficial effect of digoxin in reducing hospital admissions for heart failure. Heart failure usually follows a downhill progressive course, and drug therapy in many cases can only slow down this progressive course. There are several invasive options that are available, and they should be attempted whenever indicated and available. Coronary revascularization through bypass surgery and possible surgical ventricular restoration may improve the quality of life and the ejection fraction in patients who have significant ischemia and viable myocardium. Cardiac resynchronization therapy using biventricular pacing can improve the ejection fraction, symptoms, and survival in patients whose ECGs shows left bundle branch block and a QRS that is more than 130 milliseconds. Patients with a poor ejection fraction that's less than 35% and that does not improve on maximum medical treatment have a high risk of sudden cardiac death. Therefore, they may benefit from the prophylactic insertion of a defibrillator. Patients with refractory heart failure in the absence of multi-organ dysfunction may improve with a mechanical circulatory device. These devices are expensive, very expensive. They can cause infection, thrombosis, bleeding. They, they can still be used as a temporary measure for critically ill patient or as a destination long-term treatment. Some patients show a dramatic response to these assist devices and completely regain their ventricular function. The ultimate treatment of heart failure can be cardiac transplantation. However, this procedure is limited by the logistics of organ donation in developing countries and by the limited number of donors in developing countries. This slide summarizes the broad lines for the treatment of symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Diuretics are given in the minimum effective dose that relieves the symptoms and signs of congestion. ACE inhibitors beta blockers should be up titrated to the maximum tolerated dose. If the patient is still symptomatic, then an MRA should be added, a pleurinol or spironolactone, and also titrated to the maximum possible dose. If the patient still remains symptomatic after diuretics, ACE inhibitor, beta blockers, and MRAs, 
then one of the following three options should be considered. If a Bradini of the heart rate is more than 70 beats per minute, angiotensin re neprilysin receptor antagonist to be added instead of ACE inhibitors, and CRT if the QRS duration is more than 130 milliseconds. If the patient remains symptomatic despite all these previous measures, then we should consider adding digoxin or better referral for a left ventricular assist device or heart transplantation if available.